So our final session, we're concluding the day with a session that's emphasizing reproducibility. And uh, the session is going to be starring the, the people on the panel and the people that um, those of you who are watching the webinar can see in the images. And if you're interested in reproducibility, and most of us in research are today, then you're familiar with the words and with the terms in green. And um, the, the speakers in this session are all involved in initiatives that, um, that, that are the terms in orange. So I think we're going to be hearing more about them in this session, and you'll probably be hearing more about them in the future. And the, we're going to start with uh, Professor Dernagel. Um, in the, and from the Charité in Berlin. Where did this thing go? <laughs> I walked away with it. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Maybe you'll regret it uh, <laughs> because um, I'm uh, actually not so optimistic as uh, some of the previous speakers with uh, whether we are ready to implement some of the things that we have heard this morning. But I'm rushing ahead. Um, the approach I, I'm going to take is the one of a translational stroke researcher, which I am. Um, and so what I would like to um, share with you is some worst practice, actually, from my field, because um, I think we can learn a lot of the threats that we have um, that uh, prevent us from uh, being successful in translation. Um, and from, from those threats and from those mistakes and problems, I think we can hopefully learn um, and do better. So um, in a nutshell, um, the, the field I work with has, a, I think, a, a rather dismal track record with respect to translation. But you can uh, probably change the word stroke for Alzheimer's, ALS, and so forth. and you probably have the same, um, you will get the same results. So over the last decades, we have uh, definitely killed millions of um, animals in our experiments. We have found very effective treatments in these uh, experimental models. Um, we have produced uh, lots of high-ranking uh, articles. Uh, we have certainly burned a lot of money. Um, and all this supports the careers of uh, many, many scientists and clinicians. And uh, the question really is uh, how much uh, we have brought uh, of this to our patients. And the answer in stroke is definitely zero. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we, we do not have any treatment that emerged uh, from animal experimentation in acute or chronic stroke therapy. Um, if you want to be a bit more um, quantitative about it, um, and there's uh, actually a lot of data on it, but this is just one example. This is uh, from a meta-analysis from Malcolm McLeod's group. Um, and what you see on the left side is a long list of um, neuroprotectants, agents that protect the brain um, in a stroke. And uh, you'll find 20,000 animals in this meta-analysis. These are hundreds of studies. Um, and in each of those studies, uh, the drug was effective, and the mean uh, treatment effect was roughly 30%. So infarcts in these animals were 30% smaller. This is actually uh, a great hope. This is tremendous, and this is what we would like to see. The problem is, and that's shown on this slide, and that's just a, a very long list, and it's a partial list of phase three clinical trials in stroke uh, that were trying uh, to uh, bring these drugs, the ones that you have seen beforehand, uh, to the patient, and they were all either neutral or they were even negative, meaning that the um, study drug um, harmed patients. Now, um, this is the situation right now. Uh, we have, uh, we can treat stroke patients. We, we thrombolize them pharmacologically. Now we have also an intervention, um, but we don't have uh, neuroprotection and we don't have any of those uh, wonderful drugs that were so effective in our animal experiments. Now, why is this? Um, <coughs> is it, and that would be the most simple answer, because animal experiments are not predictive at all, because animals are animals, uh, mice are mice, and they are not um, humans, and uh, the, uh, all these drugs, uh, therefore, wouldn't work. Um, that is most definitely a 
in, in this particular uh, instance a, uh, an explanation we cannot rule out, but it's highly unlikely, I think. Um, and to uh, give you um, some arguments why I think this is unlikely, I'll uh, show you just a few um, cases of successful translation in stroke. Um, but these are not drug, drugs, this is, um, well, in fact, only one is, could, you could count as a, as a drug, but you'll see that most of this is about principles, about biology. So um, fibrinolysis actually was shown in a rabbit model um, 10 years before the uh, famous NIH-sponsored uh, trial showed it to be effective in patients. Um, but um, this, this could be seen, at least theoretically, as a case of successful translation. The, the problem here was that um, the, the, at that time the clinical trials were already running, and this was because, of course, uh, the drug has already been shown to be effective in myocardial infarction in patients, and this is why it was taken to stroke. But nevertheless, uh, it worked in an animal model, or it works in animal models, uh, and it works in humans. Um, even more, I think, uh, promising and interesting is the fact that the time window for this treatment, um, which um, is short, it's, it's, it's in an hour range, this is the human um, uh, time range, um, is, and that's also from a meta-analysis, uh, including 3,000 animals, is um, about the same, which is um, actually quite uh, interesting because many people have argued that the tissue clock of the brain of a mouse is running faster, or some have argued slower, but it seems that this, that, uh, this tissue clock is actually um, having a sort of a similar speed. Um, just, I'm just flashing by a few of those, um, I think, remarkable uh, cases where we can actually say that translation works. So uh, the penumbra concept, so many of you will not uh, know what this is, but um, it was uh, initially developed in monkeys, it exists in mice, and now it's the basis for human diagnostic and also therapeutic imaging. It's kind of a concept that relates to the fact how tissue damage um, progresses after a, um, after a stroke has taken place. Um, and it, it appears to be uh, very much identical um, in rodents, uh, subhuman primates, and primates. Um, electrophysiological phenomena, uh, cortical spreading depolarizations being such uh, phenomena. So this is a, these are uh, waves of, of brain depolarization uh, that occur after a stroke, first shown in, in rats, uh, and, and the results are enlarged uh, infarcts. And then using invasive electrodes, also shown in humans, and also shown that infarcts grow with those depolarizations in humans. Another example, venturing uh, off, away from the brain, even though we are still talking about stroke, a stroke produces an immunodepression, and um, this immunodepression is, oops, this immunodepression is seen in um, mice. It's rapid, it's, uh, it, it uh, involves uh, cellularity of the immune system, also function, and we see the same changes and also the same kinetic in patients, very similar. Um, there is also now a whole industry of post hoc prediction of failed clinical trials, which is rather strange, but um, uh, what is meant by this is that um, uh, clinical trials, as I, as I told you, uh, usually fail um, in, in, this, uh, in this diagnosis, and um, this, is, this is a famous one. It tested an anti-inflammatory drug. In fact, it was not only neutral, it was negative. In fact, the um, treated patients had a higher mortality, and in fact, um, the study had to be uh, interrupted. Um, a trend back, bed, I think they even called it in the title, a bedside to bench study then explained why this was the case. Uh, there was a problem with the antibody. Um, so I could go on with this. I, 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 um, I have to admit that this is kind of cherry picking, but um, these, um, uh, this is an article where we have put uh, more of those examples together. So um, this should make us hopeful. Now, um, what, what, then is, what then is the problem? Why are we not getting those uh, drugs uh, that work in animals to our patients? Well, there may be many reasons, but um, let me just give you a few of them. One is that, um, in general, and, and now uh, I'm, uh, my sort of the data that I'm uh, drawing upon comes from the stroke field, but uh, everywhere else where it has been checked, um, uh, we find 
the same numbers. So there is tremendous selection bias in, in all these animal studies, meaning uh, very low prevalence of, uh, ran of um, uh, randomization, roughly 30%. There is uh, a very high performance and detection bias, only 30% or so are blind. Uh, there's a high attrition bias. Just uh, think of those studies that you read where um, you find that the uh, treatment group um, and the control group have different um, sizes, n equal, n, like, n, n equal 6 versus n equal 8 or so. Um, and the reason for this mostly is attrition in groups, groups which is normally not explained. Um, there is another big problem, and that has to do with external or construct validity. <coughs> Um, for example, in stroke, um, I, in this case, I'm, I was just um, trying to um, visualize what we are actually doing when we are studying these, these mice that are three weeks old or four weeks old, um, that are inbred, usually C57 or, uh, or, uh, or uh, SV129 mice. Um, it's, it's kind of a cohort of healthy pubertal males. Uh, uh, they are t all twins. We raised them in, well, let's say six square meter isolated tents uh, and we feed them on granola. And, and you, obviously you know that this is not um, typical for, for our patients. Um, this is of course because we know uh, there are lots of confounders in our patients um, and everywhere where it has been looked, um, we, we and others found that uh, there are big uh, differences in terms of responses to drugs with gender, age, and hypertension. This is showing here um, just a, an example of a drug that works in males and doesn't work in females, a drug, or in fact, this is a genetic manipulation, but in the same paper, they show it with a drug um, that in, in aged animals, uh, it doesn't work. It works in, in uh, younger animals. Um, here is an example of where a, an intervention didn't work uh, because the animals were hypertensive. So um, these confounders, which are, of course, highly relevant um, for our patient populations, um, they make a, a very big difference, and we are very often just not taking them into account. Um, then there's another problem, uh, and this is less uh, well known to uh, many experimenters. That is, in fact, something we are proud of, and that's our high degree of, of standardization. Um, but um, what standardization basically does, it, it lowers external validity um, uh, by, the, by the simple fact that we are controlling um, and, and reducing the influence of factors that we know. We unmask uh, the effects uh, of so-called nuisance variables that we don't know, um, creating sort of noise in our data, which makes the data less reproducible and I think also less applicable um, to patients. Um, th these are from studies from Hanno Wirbel, who has um, uh, worked on this um, and elaborated the concept. Um, one other issue that we are actually not talking about, but I think should talk much more about, is the problem of uh, speci specific pathogen-free housing. Um, now, there are a few papers out there that show uh, the immune system of wild mice and or pet shop mice. Um, and it's actually not so much of a surprise that uh, our laboratory mice, and we all, or many of us who work with these mice know what kind of a, uh, immune status they have. They have an immune status of a newborn, basically. This is shown here, neonatal human laboratory mouse. Um, and that's an adult human, and this is for, for T cells, for B cells, for, for also for innate immunity. Now, interestingly, this is not a property of the laboratory mouse per se, but if you, because if you co-house the laboratory mouse with, for example, pet shop mice that you bought just uh, in a pet shop, they develop a normal immune system, which is just like um, uh, and, and very similar to the immune system um, of um, adults and also adult humans. And I think this, is, this has tremendous consequences uh, for our data that, uh, or for, for the ability to translate um, our data to humans. Now, another problem, and this is also something that um, I, I really don't see how this in its personalized or individualized approaches will, will be taken care of, is the fact that there is a complete power failure in the way we do experiments. That means that the, the ends that, that, that are so low that in, in, in those experiments um, and we did a large uh, meta-analysis and uh, mean group sizes in my field, but this is, can also be generalized, is 
uh, roughly eight, uh, which gives you, if you take into account those um, effect sizes, and effects are usually pretty big, um, there, there's a mean statistical power of less than 50%, and with a little bit of math or biostatistics, you can predict that the false positive rate uh, under such circumstances must be around 50%. And if there is a fall, if there is a true effect, um, you are going to overestimate it by also roughly 50%. Now, um, that was sort of uh, really quick. And uh, for those of you who are interested to dig a little bit deeper, this is a reference where I've gone into more detail. Now, um, finally, and you, you might um, ask why um, I'm um, haven't touched upon personalized or individualized medicine uh, at this point, and um, this is my only personalized uh, slide. Um, uh, and I, on purpose, uh, wanted to be really uh, specific and focusing on on the the uh, that data that we have from uh, let's call it population animal experiments. Um, uh, because uh, there we know a lot, and I, I think most of this will also be relevant to, to more personalized approaches. And this is, um, we have heard about it, a co-clinical trial, uh, the co-clinical trial approach where you select anti-cancer drugs um, for individual patients when, by screening transplanted um, mice um, with xenografts from patients. Um, so I, I think, um, the, the same issues, and some of them even um, it, more importantly, will come up um, as um, in those other uh, sort of more traditional experiments that I just showed, uh, the question of uh, statistical power, um, the spontaneous heterogeneity that is there, the multiple bias that we have to take care of, um, comorbidities and, and confounders, um, how are we going to deal with this, the immune system, um, a lot of these mice, um, especially for the xenotransplants, are immunodeficient, uh, so you do not have a contribution of the immune system at all, um, and so forth. So um, I'm, I'm already at my conclusions, um, and that is um, I think uh, we really need to um, be aware of the fact that uh, the way we do animal experiments uh, right now um, has a very low internal, external, and construct validity. Um, quite often, I think the basic biology in principle is preserved. Um, this allows us to maybe pick low-hanging fruits, uh, meaning where we have large effect sizes. Um, but it, with respect to drug development, um, where especially in our patients, the effect sizes are much smaller, uh, we are getting into trouble. Um, besides um, deficient rigor, which I was talking about, I think uh, major culprits here are uh, environmental factors, which we are not taking care of. Uh, this includes infections, um, Im immature immune systems that we work with, I think SPF mice. Um, we are not looking at comorbidities um, and aging, and we probably have a too high degree of standardization. Um, quite often also we, um, we mix up exploration with confirmation, so we come up with a hypothesis and prove it in the same experiment. Um, and so um, in closing, I would argue that uh, most uh, of these issues um, which have confounded uh, those sort of population models and will also haunt us um, in more personalized models, and so we need to be aware of them. Thank you.